Good, let's make uh, a small start already um, by inviting um, Fiona and Adina to the stage. Fiona Passantino and Adina Edme. Fiona is, uh, well, she worked for a lot of companies, but one of the recent ones was Danone. She's, I think you're independent at, the, uh, at this moment. You're an author as well. And Adina uh, is head of communications and PR at Decathlon Digital. Um, I would love you both to introduce yourself. And I will come and sit with you. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Henk. Thanks, Victoria, for this uh, incredible organization. I know this is a, a lot of work. Wonderful to be here for the second year. Yes, I'm independent. I've been in communications. I'm one of the ones that raised their hand for the, the third block, <laughs> almost 20 years, and specializing in large corporations. Recently now independent, so I'm a, in a, a employee engagement communication and culture specialist, and I spent about 80% of my mental energy focusing on AI integration strategies for communications teams. Hello, everyone. Thank you for inviting me. I'm very happy to be a part of this conference. Uh, with the experience over two decades in communication fields, I have worked in different areas, uh, PR, uh, public affairs, government relations, internal, inter external communication, strategic, and corporate. And there is a twist, actually, three years ago, I dived uh, headfirst in the amazing world of technology and digital communication. Uh, I started to be fluent, to um, geek speak, and um, I discovered the amazing topics related to the data, data literacy, data culture, cybersecurity awareness, cybersecurity, cyber crisis, communication, product management, digital product, digital and technology transformation, and also how to attract the top-notch tech, um, tech talents. Uh, hailing from the Central Asia, actually, which is in the middle of the Silk Way, I bring also to the table my uh, multicultural um, perspective. And uh, when I'm not um, uh, working in communication field, actually, you can find me on the dance hall or ice, ice rink because I am passionate about figure skating, enthusiast, and proud mother of two seven and ten year daughter who are um, professional figure skaters. So again, very happy to be here, to be part of this panel. I'm very eager to share with you my insights and also hope um, to learn from you a lot. And I have already learned a lot this, since this morning, thank you. And let's do this conference, um, a very inspiring uh, moment, full of meaningful connections. So thank you again for having me here. Um, nice pirouettes and jumps now. Um, we had to jump a lot because COVID came and then we all started to work remote. Then uh, there was a war in the Ukraine uh, starting. It, it had a lot of effect on, on all of us. Uh, and how did that influence your strategy to engage employees? Well, Hank, uh, really that influenced drastically. Um, for me, the story, as I told, started really three years ago when I jumped, when I changed my gears to join the IT service of Decathlon. At that time, actually, I was proposed to accompany by um, the communication, the digital transformation of the whole group. At that time, the chief operation officer told me something mind-blowing. I didn't come with me. We are going to transform the company by transforming the mindset of uh, digital and tech teams. And just let me give you some details. Digital and tech teams, IT service in Decathlon are 5,000 people in 70 countries. It's massive. And um, timing-wise, I joined this department a week before the first total lockdown, and I have never expected that. So I had to manage to create a new strategy with a lighting speed, actually. Uh, to align 5,000 teammates worldwide, and at that time, 
the uh, mindset of the team was very, uh, the, the organization of the IT at that time was very monolithic from the one hand and very fragmented and siloed by countries from the other hand as well, with a quite rigid mindset and very unflexible operating models. And at that time, the idea was really to bring together everybody around the whole a holistic, uh, strong strategy to bring to build the future, the digital future of the Catalan, and do everything remotely for the very, very first time in the life of the Catalan group. So that was the very huge challenge. And COVID drastically, drastically influenced that. From one side, we had to really very rapidly learn uh, and deploy the new digital tools, how to work together, how to share the information, how to um, co collaborate, collaborate or cooperate efficiently. But from the other hand, that helped me a lot because that was at the time where all spotlights turned to my digital and tech teams, from the nerds of the company, from the people uh, providing uh, just uh, in very complicated IT services. They became the rock stars, the savior actually of the company. And we came up at that moment with a new concept with, that we called enablers. We told to the whole those 5,000 uh, tech guys, Guys, now you are enablers of the business. You are enablers of the company. And we created the holistic design system and strong identity around this world of enablers. That was not just a buzzword. That was really the, uh, the philosophy behind that. Uh, we created uh, the, um, the brand, uh, we created the uh, visual charter, very identifiable and very disruptive as well. Uh, we created the tone of specific tone of voice and we deployed different communication channels, communication support and everything to help people, my tech teams, to identify themselves as the enablers and to revendicate that to the whole company. So that was really the big, big uh, thing we, we, we done and we've got a very, very nice results with that. Good, good. Fiona, you worked for some very large companies. Um, how did it affect you personally? And I know you, uh, uh, we have changed some information already. I know you're someone who sees a threat as an opportunity as well. How did you handle that? Right, well, I think uh, like all of you, we all were impacted by what happened to COVID. And I think a lot of you found, especially in comms, that with it came a great opportunity. We sort of were catapulted in this digital universe that we didn't understand. But I'm actually not gonna talk about COVID because for me, it's like a test case for the big disruption which is coming. And we're talking, of course, about AI and what's that going to do to our jobs. Goldman Sachs predicted that it will impact about 300 million jobs worldwide. And a lot of this impact is going to fall on you and on me because we're in communication. This is generative technology, which means it is creating text. It's creating images. And what do we do? We're communicators. We create text. We create creativity, strategy, and imagery, PowerPoint presentations, events. So we need to also be in a different mindset and one of enabling ourselves to look at this as an opportunity. So when we're looking ahead, I think the most important thing that we learned from COVID is first of all, not to be afraid, to understand that this is coming to understand that we have learned to be flexible. We have learned to learn. We all got a crash course in viral technology and risk analysis. We became digital heroes overnight, like uh, similar to your team. And we learned that we can do it. We can be trusted to carry out our work in a fully remote environment. We don't really know what the full impact is going to be once this technology rolls out. We know that it's happening now. We know that it is as transformative as fire, the wheel, the internet. We don't actually know what's going to happen, but we know that we can do it. That's a real big challenge, by the way. We will come back on that uh, later in the discussion. Um, Adina, you told that your IT nerds, with all respect, became the enablers. Could you uh, take us in the next step of that travel and, and what new uh, means, what new innovations, what new ways of working did you introduce for the company who were effective? 
Well, um, we started it with the at the same time as the COVID, uh, and so now it's not so much new, but at that time uh, it was quite um, quite disruptive for us. Uh, first, of course, it was to create a very strong and appealing appealing change story that um, that uh, sounds to the tech and digital team and that distinguishes them uh, in in the middle of the whole company. When we say actually culture eats strategy for the breakfast, that's right. I, I definitely agree with that. And um, I started really to create a kind of subculture within the holistic culture of the Decathlon for my team, for our digital and tech teammates. And uh, we started to work on different components. If we take culture as soci so, so, social sociology, uh, at, in sociological terms, uh, we, to, we started to, re, uh, ro, uh, to work on these components taking into account the rights, languages, symbols, norms, values, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we created different events, regular events, from small meetings to large meetings, which became our rites and rituals. We put spotlights and uh, highlighted some profiles, uh, specific profiles, or some board of, board of directors as our heroes, seeing their story and, and seeing stories by their voices as well. Uh, we created the, as I told, very distinguished uh, visual charter with logos, newsletters, PowerPoint templates, signatures, um, meet backgrounds, and so on, in order also to, to distinguish the symbolism of uh, belonging to this community of enablers. Um, we decided also, we de uh, defined the specific tone of voice also, how we are going to speak to the company, how we are going to push the business to get on board on our strategy. And this, this is what, that was the work on the specific language for us that it distinguished us as a subculture within Decathlon. And of course, we started to use different digital tools um, existing already in the company, or new one in uh, like interactive platforms, digital workplace, um, video conferencing, uh, conferencing, large uh, large scale meetings, and so on and so on. Hopefully, the Catalan has already been um, fully cloud company, so we have already all those tools available. So we we can work at any time from any uh, destination uh, on the shared files. Um, we have some co collaborative tools available to the company, and we can do it at the same, at the same more instantly, actually, and seamlessly. Uh, seamless, I'm sorry, in the company. Um, we deploy the events, as I told, uh, with a very strong identity as well. And that created a very strong commitment, these kind of events, because we really paid a lot of attention on speakers' uh, choice, on content management, on design system, from the very start, start jungle to the end of the event, everything was really thought by my dir um, artistic dir uh, direction to really uh, to feel people uh, proud of this event and to make them come into these events as well. Uh, we also worked a lot on creating the ambassadors network because I have 70 countries with different cultures, different languages. And these ambassadors, sometimes from digital teams, sometimes some activists, they helped us also to emphasize, to spread the message, and also to go as close as, as possible to our final uh, audience. Sometimes just spreading the message, sometimes adapting to the local culture and local languages as well. So nothing basically new, but at that time that was so much condensed and everything was created from the scratch that created actually this kind of disruption. I love your passion, uh, <laughs> by the way, in talking about it. And now Fiona, um, the next step, artificial intelligence, it will be a much bigger event, a disruption, whatever you call it, than COVID, probably. I share your vision. Um, it, it makes me a bit scared and it makes me a bit enthusiastic as well. And I think in the audience there are a lot of people who are in the lead of their communications department or at least uh, very important influencers. How, how could they bring that message to, their, to those co-workers? Because I can imagine they will be scary as well. This is a totally normal feeling, by the way. So if you're scared, um, this is how I usually start my uh, webinars, is uh, on a scale of one to 10, how scared are you? <laughs> how many of you are already using these tools, whether it's uh, ChatGDP at work, not just uh, to plan your, your, your hard, uh, difficult conversation emails? Okay, great. How about with image generation? Anybody doing DALI 
or mid-journey, stable diffusion. Excellent, okay, all right. And as far as your leadership, any raise of hands as to how does your manager, your direct manager feel about using these tools? Do you do it secretly or are you fully supported? So fully supported, raise your hands. Okay, this I think is what we're looking at here. This is our landscape. Usually we communicators are ahead of the game and we have to be ambassadors for our profession, for our um, knowledge. We know what we're doing and we understand how these tools, because we use them in our, let's say, private life first, we take them out for a spin, and then we usually have to feed it up the chain. A lot of other professions don't have to do this. Usually you're told what to do and what to learn by your boss. Um, and I, I really love this example where you're talking about a major cultural shift and with events and with tooling. And I, I understand you're focusing on two things, which is tooling and culture and all the events around it. I think combining this message with your question of are you afraid, this is our opportunity. It actually doesn't matter what we feel about it. We can spend a lot of time and a lot of energy asking ourselves, what do you think? Is this bad? Is this good? Is it going to destroy us? It's a waste of our time and energy to ask ourselves how we feel. Let's use that energy to learn, to understand, to find the opportunities, and to build celebratory cultural events around this, where we feel we're given the tools that we need, the knowledge that we need, and the mindset where we can all be engagement enablers of our own. Thank you, that's some great advice. Um, Adina, are you gonna use some of that advice for your organization, how you see the next step? AI, I mean, right? AI? Yes. AI tools. Well, um, today, yes, my team uh, use some AI tools, uh, but mostly for um, to save time, actually, or to make some um, uh, operational tasks like uh, video subtitling, translations, and things like that, like that, that help us to save time a lot, especially for my creative and design studio, and uh, to save time to do what they do the best, actually, is to create magic. So this is the very strong point. For me, I don't think that the, the, the biggest danger cam, come, uh, comes from the AI tools, but the biggest danger comes from the unsupervised uh, and unresponsible um, use of these AI tools. Uh, I think in the, as communicators, we have this role as well to educate our teammates about the risks that AI tools as any tool that operates and store a lot of data and sometimes a lot of personal data or sensitive and confidential data. We have to educate our teammates about these risks and we have to work closely with different partner departments which are, and for me this, I'm in, in, in the middle of that actually with uh, cybersecurity teams, with data teams, data protection teams, legal teams, purchase teams, to really create the very strong guidelines and governance about the usage of these uh, tools. And it, it, it makes for any actually uh, SaaS tools like the same, the same idea is about that. I think this is the challenge. Fiona, how important is that governance? Governance is uh, absolutely critical. Yeah, thanks for saying those words. Because we don't know what is okay and what's not okay. There are data breach um, implications. There are companies that are simply shutting it off. No use of chat GTP at all, without even understanding why. And I think it's really important to have those governance conversations as soon as possible. Yesterday, we have this learning curve that's like this. And do we want to be on this part of the learning curve when we have this much to learn, or do we want to wait and have this much to learn? So it's the earlier the better. Governance is important because how do we know what to use? If you don't have clear guidelines as to whether to use it or not, people are going to opt to use it. And it's amazing how you, you think that people will just understand um, these tools and not use it in a certain way, but you'd be surprised. People do need some very clear direction, and that only comes with education. Yes. Earlier this morning, you were in one of those groups, and as a spokesperson, you, you told us uh, about communication bottom-up and top-down. And 
here it's how do you avoid top-down messages? Should you avoid it or could it be okay as well? I think you need both. You need a spectrum because there are some times when you have to have messages from top down. And I think governance is a great example of this. Uh, crisis communication, like what we had in COVID, you need top down messages. How often are you coming into work? When is it okay? When is it not okay? How can you use AI? When is it okay? When that These are top down communications. Bottom up is also quite interesting because now all of us have this power. We're all multilingual. We can all speak basically any language we want. We can all be visual communicators. We can create original material to make our PowerPoint uh, presentations amazing. We all have these tools. So the bottom up part now is a more empowered uh, workflow than it used to be. So I think the constellation is the same as before. You're going to have both. There are going to be different reasons for both. But now we have new tools to enable us to all level up professionally. Um, Adina, do you see a danger of uh, also creating a gap with all this new AI between, let's say, the more non-digital co-workers and the younger, more digital ones? Um, can because you just, uh, yeah, the, explain the question. I, I, I'll give myself as an example. Yeah. I'm an older guy, I feel 18, but I'm not. Um, I have children and uh, they're very digital and they were one of the first to use ChatGPT. So I'm, I'm lucky, although often because of my age, I, I wouldn't start myself spontaneously, be, but because they teach me, I, I know what, what, it, what it is, what I can do with it, etc. But a lot of people will not make, probably will not make that step. How, how do you include them as well. Okay, I see. So this is, I think the question is also quite beyond the communication. Um, I'm lucky as well, well I, I have two kids as well, but yeah, I'm lucky to be emerged into the heart of the digital transformation of the company. So I'm surrounded by people speaking data, AI, machine learning, and it's my everyday topics, and they are very high exp expert on that. So I have this chance to, to work closely with them uh, on a on daily basis. But beyond, I have, beyond my team, we have 100,000 teammates worldwide in the Castellan with different jobs in retail, in supply and logistics, in production, and so on and so on. And perhaps they are more, uh, they are less digital skilled. And this is the, the topic uh, that, that's why I told it's beyond communication, it's more employee, uh, people employee, people experience, and HR topic, how to work together to, for digital upskilling, for digital uh, transformation of jobs as well, how to accompany, how to learn, how to provide necessary training, uh, trainings for our teammates to leverage their understanding of, um, of all those, of those tools and uh, challenges of the digital world. I had to learn speak geek, as I told you, but uh, <laughs> in very accelerated, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, tailor-made by myself actually programmed during the COVID. But yeah, now we, we are working hardly on this shift actually also to provide those kind of upskilling and reskilling uh, for our teammates. Yeah, and trying to leave no one behind. Uh, Fiona, if, if we look at this subject, you're an author as well. Can we ex ex expect something in the near future of you, uh, a publication or maybe even a book? Oh, well, thank you for asking, that's kind. Um, I, am, um, I write comic books about engagement and communication and happy to share those, of course. But my secret project, or maybe not so secret, is uh, creating a fully generated book uh, illustrated by Midjourney and written um, co-written co um, by these tools and to just see how fast it can be done. So my goal is to have a full trade publication of 75,000 words uh, within a month's time. Um, the, I have a literary agent who thinks I'm off my rocker, but we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> He'll owe me a beer. Yeah. When can we expect something? Then we will uh, we will follow you and uh, and see if we can order a copy. Thank you. That's really kind. Well, yes. I'm, I'm September one is my deadline. So, Good. Uh, there we go. Yeah. You'll write it in your agendas. Um, I look at the deadline, so I think I will be uh, enabling you to ask some questions. Who has some? Hi, um, my question is, 
With artificial intelligence and the future that's coming, we don't know what it is, but it's coming. What do you both predict for the communication teams? Um, I can, uh, I'll start and then pass it over. Okay, well, we know that it's not just coming, it's actually already here. So what is the situation now? Is that if you compare AI to a baby, the baby is about three months old, right? Now, at a certain point, the baby is gonna grow and become a teenager. Right now, the baby still requires us to have all of its input and direction fed to it. At a certain point, if you ever know about, I, I'm sure you know this very well, about exponentiality. We can't understand exponentiality with our human brains, but it goes like this. This is a learning curve of AI, right? And our learning curve as humans is probably like this. At a certain point, this curve is going to intersect with our curve, this exponential curve. And that's the moment where we call singularity, which is when the gen generalized artificial intelligence will match our own. And then it goes exponential from here. So at a certain point, we will have to deal with an alien intelligence that we are gonna share our planet with probably for the rest of our lives, uh, the rest of humanity. And this is just something, it's all, that part is not there yet. We are still over here where we're dealing, we are still in the driver's seat as humans. The, the things that we are doing are still being read by humans. Now, a little bit further in the future, we humans are not going to be able to keep up with this explosion of content because the downside of everybody being an enabled communicator is that we're going to have a lot more content. Everybody's gonna be able to write a book, everybody will be writing music, everybody will be billowing out articles, thought leadership, you'll name it, we will not be able to read all the material that's about to come at us. So what's the natural next step? AI is going to be reading for us. Right now we're still writing for humans, but pretty soon we're gonna be writing for AI. So we're gonna have AI writing and AI reading and probably summarizing and collapsing things into bullets for the human to interact with, right? So if we try to use our imaginations, and that's where we have a superpower because we communicators, we have creativity, to try to figure out what is going to be happening in our field two months, six months, seven months from now, and already start preparing our teams for that scenario. Not for what's happening now, but for what's going to be happening in six months' time. Wow, <laughs> it's very profound reflection. Thank you a lot, really, really. Um, well, um, I, I didn't think so so much about this topic, uh, but what I would like perhaps to oppose, and this is today my conviction, I would like to oppose our AI, which is artificial intelligence, to EI, which is emotional intelligence. And today the emotional intelligence is something that we as human beings have, and this is one of our, I think, strongest point compared to the AI. And I, when I see my creative teams, really, and this is this is the word they know. They they are already they they are always um, laughing when I'm coming and say, guys, I have an idea. You need to create some magic for me. And they knows they knows that what I'm expecting that they will. Bring, bring, uh, break out, uh, break, um, I'm sorry, break everything. They need to think out of the box and to surprise everybody around them. And this is, and that passes through the empathy, from design thinking process, you know, from very profound research and empathy, observation, thinking out of the box, and all those things that human beings have actually. And this is our, uh, I think this is the, the, the core difference between those two, uh, two dimensions, let's say. Exactly, double down on our humanity. So what do we bring as strengths? The human part. We don't need to be technical anymore, we don't need to be scientific anymore, but we need to be double human. Perfect. And that's a big challenge as well. One more question, please, before we go to the next one. Anyone? Next to you. Thank you. I am very curious of what you've said to companies who had, have shut it down uh, for IP reasons, really high security. What kind of things have you been talking to these people about? Well, I haven't been dealing with any company that has had that policy, so I, I can't answer that question. I, I, do you have an answer to that one? or? 
um, I, I didn't uh, I, I didn't really catch. So uh, you mean uh, the policy for AI uh, yeah, governance? Yeah, okay. all the platforms. Okay, so things. today it's really under construction. Everything is really. Uh, this is the topic we are working hardly right now with. The, so I told legal data and uh, cybersecurity teams, and it's under definitions because yeah, for those tools. Uh, the roadmap are not clear, it's kind of black box tools as well, so we need really to investigate better how we will use it. And we are creating the specific also department within the company to work on this kind of applications in different different um, fields of, of the company, not only in communication. So the work is going on now. Right, because every time you actually put something into the into the the field, the entry field, you're actually feeding data right into the algorithm, yeah. and it's t taking your information as well. So it's not just, you know, a local thing running on your machine. It's actually feeding into the big soup. That's why it was banned in our company, because we deal a lot with IP, of course, and feeding that into our system, um, even with geopolitics and things like this, like you're really running a risk with China, et cetera, and depending on the kind of industries you're in, uh, it really is um, a I think there's still some, uh, for some companies, quite some road to go. What, what I could say is what's safer is to actually have these things running locally. So the, the, the difference, for instance, between mid-journey and stable diffusion is stable diffusion is something that is run locally on your system, and you, then you can box it off. Then you train it with your own materials, and you keep it uh, in a box, and you don't let it escape your, uh, your firewalls. That common, the using mid-journey, for instance, you're dealing with the giant soup out there. You're throwing things into the void and you're getting things out of the void, and that's a fundamentally unsafe environment. That's that's all I can say. Good. I would thank you so much, Adina Etme. Good luck with your journey within Decathlon. Thank you. Uh, it will be challenging. And Fiona, and remember all, put it in your agendas. Just before the 1st of September, we will all order your new book and we're very curious. Thank you so much. Thank you.